From the studios in beautiful Oceanport, New Jersey, welcome to the biggest and greatest podcast ever. I'm your host, Ray Kay. Hey everybody, Ray Kay here. This is another edition of Catching Up with Ray Kay. I am excited because a lot of things have been going on over the last, I guess, four or five weeks. Um, But I'm going to talk about a few things, my usual three. Uh, This will be a weekly segment now because a lot of people want to know what Ray Kay is up to and, you know, my thoughts and my my observations out there in the world. So I'm going to talk about my London trip I just took. I'm going to talk about that concierge service that took a big turn over the last week. And then I'm going to talk about my all-time baseball team. So I think I got a pretty good team that's unbeatable. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that too. Uh, my trip to London was great. I went last weekend to see my son. It was uh, one thing I did notice though. I did take the subway and I, uh, I took the, this express to the underground and then I took a few undergrounds to get to my destination. And then I had to take a Uber to get to uh, my son's apartment where uh, I met him and we had a beautiful dinner and a really great weekend. And that total cost was about... I did a round trip, which was 32, it was just a figure of 20 plus 6 when I took the regular subway, so I went to 26 plus 8, so about 34 pounds for the whole thing. And I took an Uber back uh, when I did my return, and it was about 42 pounds. So uh, if you ever do it, it's about a 10-pound saving. So you know, Uber might be the way to go uh, for convenience if anyone ever does that again. But it was a great trip. London uh, is uh, my favorite city, I believe. Um, I've been there. Uh, I've been to a lot of them, and London beats them all. You know, everybody speaks my language. Everybody's civil. I mean, it, you know, it's just it's amazing how polite everybody is in there. It's not overwhelming. You know, it's not too busy. The streets, you could walk on the sidewalks. You could walk, pop into a cafe, and it's not crowded. Um, there's all different areas, and each area seems a little, little bit unique. You know, so I mean, it's sprawling, and uh, it's it's almost even by far my favorite city. Um, I went to the Abbey Road crossing, which is a must for me since I'm a Beatles fan. And that was cool. I hung out there for about an hour, just observing all the people that go there uh, from around the world, which really shows me the power of the Beatles. I don't even, don't even know if any other types of groups have this kind of thing where there's a crossing, and they cross it on a, on a great album, an Abbey Road album. They show their picture on the cover of the album, and since then, everybody goes there just to see where the Beatles walked and to be on the uh, same street as the Beatles. You know, I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing. That this happens probably to be the most famous tourist attraction in London, you know, with people taking pictures. It's continual, too. I mean, it must be like 100 to 200, you know, people out there. They're hanging on this wall, this graffiti wall that leads into the Abbey Road Studios. And, uh, you know, it's colorful. It's uh, when you look out there and you see that famous you know, street, the way it looks from the album, you know, I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. I happened to pick a sunny day. So it was almost just the exact same day when they took the picture. So I took, you know, about 28 pictures uh, of all different angles of me walking. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's not long. I mean, you, you could walk over that thing in about four seconds. It's, it's a real narrow type of street. And then right to the left, as you're facing down Abbey Road is their studio, you know, which is looks like a, like a house, like a big white, big house uh, with a big gated entrance. It looks just like it did back in like 1968, if you ever see photos back then. And, um, you know, that was, that was a highlight, you know, because you kind of relive everything and you realize, you know, how powerful the Beatles are to have that one street that they cross. And that's the most popular, I believe, it's the most popular sightseeing tourist attraction in, in London. I haven't seen that many cameras, actually phones taking pictures uh, the whole time I was there. I also liked uh, the little cafes you walk into. I liked, I liked the food there. I mean, the food was good. I think it's underrated because um, I really enjoyed that. Uh, the parks are beautiful. I mean, there's so many of them. I really enjoyed the different parks. You feel great walking in. They're not, they're not too huge, but it's well manicured. There's lakes. You know, they, there's daisies popping up. Uh, Regent's Park was probably the nicest one uh, that I was in. They, there's daisies all over the place. You know, it, it was a beautiful day. And I guess that that flavors my feelings because, you know, when it's nice out, everything kind of looks good. But the, uh, you know, there's ducks in the, in the, in the, in the, in the pond. Uh, it just was, uh, it just was overwhelmingly good. You could lay down, you could rest, you close your eyes, you say, oh, I'm in London. And I don't know. The parks are, are magnificent, you know, and the under- the ground is, is incredible too, how easy it is to get around. I mean, it's simple. 
you know, I mean, my son helps me a lot because he's living there and it's always good to have, you know, a local person that knows their way around because it just saves you some extra time. Um, but uh, it was uh, from one to 10, if I was rating that, as I do my pizza show, I, I rate that a good, I don't know, I give it a good 9.58. I mean, that was that's how good the London trip was. So my, my recommendation, you're going to see a city, see London. Rome's beautiful too. Uh, London's, uh, London's number one in my book. Um, I want to talk about my concierge service that um, Hello Honeydew. Um, we were grinding it out, you know, uh, having realtors give us their clients. And we were setting up services for, for them, which was fine. But we hit on something that was sort of a lucky break. And in life, you know, you get lucky breaks sometimes and you just got to be w- aware to see them. And whenever they seem to happen, it's like you need like eight things to come into play at once, you know, in your favor. I mean, it's almost like hitting a lottery. I mean, this stuff does happen. And we had a couple of the breaks come through. I mean, I mean, we're, I mean the breaks are still happening. So I'll know more in a month as this thing really unfolds. But uh, it was, it was, this is, I, I want to tell you this because this is sort of how things happen. You know, I mean, we're plugging along, doing pretty good. And all of a sudden, through a connection of mine, uh, that guy gave me one of his connections. So it was like a double connection. I got the connection and then that guy had a connection and we've been cultivating this guy since January and, um, kept, kept in touch. They have a pretty cool thing. It's called Relo Frog. Um, they have, you know, uh, realtors in their, in, in their, in their computer software system that, that connects directly to the broker and they hook everything up not only utilities they do everything there's like 12 or 14 things that every homeowner needs to do you know moving you need a mortgage company you might need a cleaning service you might you know you might need what else do you need um i can't even think of it but you you know it's like 14 possible things you need when you move into a house and um these guys do everything except actually the utilities part and um you know they um you know we've been been cultivating the, the, this, this this fellow. He's a great guy, Michael. And um, they were going to get bought out, and it did not happen. So that's one of the breaks that came into play for us. It, the buyout did not happen because of, um, I don't think the number was uh, high enough for them, whatever the reason is. Um, so they come to us, and um, they say they want us to be their utilities arm. You know, I said, that's fine. So they have um, 65,000 uh, agents in their system now, and that number is going to be growing like maybe three or four times that within the next two months. I mean, there's a couple of big things that are happening. It's under non-disclosure, which I don't even know about. But the, but that number is going to go, could go into very well hundreds of thousands of uh, realtors that are going to be in their system that uh, will be using this system. And we calculate even if 40% of them use the system, um, there's really no reason not to use the system because it helps, um, it, helps their, their, it helps their clients. And on the utility side, it helps them change change uh, to disconnect and then reconnect right on a one-stop website that no one else is doing. This is like the number two or three uh, company in the country that does this. This is how big they are. And they are also the best company that does it, you know. So, I mean, these are all the breaks that we're getting. And, um, you know, through the connection, I mean, it was it was, it was was definitely the connection. Um, and my uh, the, the main guy actually is friends with my partner because there's a big hockey connection there. So it's funny, I made all these connections and I'm like the lead guy, you know, and I had nothing to do with it other than putting people together. So, you know, I, I, I kind of stepped back a little bit. I let the connections happen now. I have no ego in this thing. And um, so because of all that, um, within the next month, uh, we're going to start setting up all these agents' utilities, um, which will be a nice phone call because it's like they call you. You know, you're not, you're not soliciting them. You know, they're calling you for the services, you know, because everybody needs the utilities when you move into a house. And everybody also needs TV, Internet, and um and phone, you know, so uh, we're going to be helping them do that. We're very good at doing that. And uh, it's going to be exciting to see where this thing goes, because, you know, this is one of those things that's a numbers game. And uh, we're kind of we kind of hit the mother load of uh, the mother load of numbers, you know, so um, 
Hey, you know, it's just it's funny how uh, everything just 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 hit at once. And I'll keep you updated on this situation because this is like a, a total game changer. And we'll know, you know, within the next month uh, as it's moving and then within the next two months, uh, it could be like uh, it could be in outer space, you know. So, uh, you know, that I will keep you abreast of on, on my next catching it. Well, I'm going to actually make this a weekly series. So maybe I'll give you the weekly update because that might even be cooler. You could see this stuff almost on live action how, how it's growing and the um my next segment is uh is my third thing is what i want to talk about my all-time favorite my all-time baseball team uh which is uh i think it's the definitive baseball team because uh, i've been following baseball since i was about seven and i played it since i was seven and a half and i got a pretty good feel for this stuff so here i'm gonna i'm gonna lay it on you i, I argue with my friends and my facebook friends and all my friends uh, on this because it's you know it's an opinion it's a it's opinion you know there's no facts on this stuff you, the only thing you go by is i guess you go by statistics i think first base is a fact i, I can't think of anyone who wouldn't have this fellow on there that i'm going to give you who, who is my first baseman but um here is my all-time the ray k all-time f- baseball lineup first base i'm, I'm not going to give the batting order i'm just going to go by position maybe on my next show i'll tell you what my batting order will be first base Iron Man, Lou Gehrig, the pride of the Yankees. Number one, there's no question about it. One of the probably the top three baseball players of all time, Lou Gehrig. Uh, second base, uh, the best I've ever seen. And, you know, I mean, there's the guys played in 1914 that are great, but I'm going to go with Rod Carew, second base. Shortstop, you know, again, there's been been many, many, many good ones. Um, back in the day, there weren't they were they weren't great hitters you know, like Luis Aparicio and these Mark Belanger, and then you get back, I guess, you know, like, you know Tony Lazeri, these guys, uh, very good fielders, Phil Rizzuto, but the hitting wasn't great, you know. So I'm going to go with a guy that was all around, that was a great, in my mind, he's a great fielder. Some people criticize him. Um, and um, I don't know why, because I've seen this guy make some of the greatest plays I've ever seen. And this guy was probably a top hitter, top top all-around guy I've seen uh, consistently. I mean, Cal Ripken's in, in argument, you know, but I'm going to go with Derek Jeter as my pick for a shortstop. Uh, third base, that's a tough one. I'm going to have a great hitting team here, so I'm going to go with uh, f- a fielding third baseman. I mean, you got Michael Schmidt, you got... Eddie Matthews, you know, well, Greg Nettles wasn't the greatest hitter compared to the other guys. Um, but as far as fielding goes, I want to have a guy that's going to be like the, um, you know, what do they call him? The vacuum cleaner. Um, and he played for the Orioles and his name was Brooks Robinson. I, I never seen the guy miss anything. He had that great World Series in 1970 when I was, you know, I took off school to watch it. And uh, this guy was uh, was amazing, you know. So, I mean, George Brett was great also. I mean, he was an unbelievable hitter. But you know Brooks uh, Brooks Robinson is my third base pick. It's hard to, hard not to pick him. Catcher is tough because I love Yogi Berra. I mean, big Yankee fan. I love Bill Dickey, um, Campanella. You know, I mean, I'm a big. Everyone knows me knows I'm a big Thurman Munson fan. But I you know I can't put him as the best catcher ever. Uh, I'm gonna go with Johnny Bench. I gotta go with Bench. I mean, growing up he was the all around guy with that rocket arm. You know, good power. You know, solid. You know, I mean, I I want him on my back on my backstop. Uh, outfield, it's always rough. I'm going to go start with left. Uh, you know, there were so many great uh, outfielders and great center fielders. Uh, I got to go Ted Williams in left. I'm going to put, even though I think he played right, but on my team, I'm going to I'm going to put him left. Uh, just the 406 and that tremendous hitting. Uh, you know, I want him on my team. You know, uh, center. It's hard to go against Willie Mays. I was a big DiMaggio fan. Uh, his his numbers were great, but Willie, you know, I mean, Willie was the guy. You know, he was, um, you know, top uh, probably top five players of all time, and I want him in my center field. I mean, the guy had made that great catch against Vic Wirtz behind the back, and then he threw it in all the way to second base from 450 feet out. You know, the guy um, the guy had it all. I think I guess you could say he was the first five tool tool player, and I call him the first modern player. Like after 1950, you know, when you felt like things were kind of getting modern in baseball. Um, Willie Mays, uh, center field. Right field, you know, there's only one right fielder. He's 
greatest baseball player of all time. Um, uh, statistically, there's no one even close to him. Uh, he also pitched, which is pretty amazing, and he had like uh, one of the best pitching records of all time, including World Series records. Of course, I'm putting him out there because of his hitting ability. Uh, he had more homers than teams, uh, totally off the charts. Uh, he saved baseball in 1920 after that 1919, uh, you know, scandal with the Black Sox uh, and Joe Chulis Joe Jackson is you know fixing the World Series. Baseball was in trouble. Babe came on the scene. He was he was nineteen. He was the nineteen twenties. I mean, he was he was the personality. Uh, hit for average, hit for homers, hit for RBIs. Um, you know, he was he he did he did everything. Um, and uh, he's my all time favorite athlete also. So right field, batting third. Uh, when I get next week to my lineup, Babe Ruth, uh, pitching. That's rough. I'm going to go with the ones I've seen. I mean, you got Christy Mathewson, you got Bob Feller back then, you know, you got uh, Satchel Page. You know, there's a bunch, a uh, bunch of pitchers. I mean, it, it, it's it's endless how many great pitchers there were. Um, left-handed pitcher, I got to go, uh, Sandy Koufax. Um, I think he had those five or six years in the middle of that career toward the end that was just uh, out of you know out of this world basically. You know, 382 strikeouts. You know, he had that 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 dominating style of pitching. You know, he's he seems to be renowned as the best left-handed pitcher, if not the best pitcher of all time. So you know, Sandy's my uh, my lead left hand pitcher, right hander's rough is tough because uh, there were so many great ones, um, including you know I'm a big Tom Seaver fan, uh, you know you had Jim Palmer, you know I won't put him that as high as Seaver, but he he was a great pitcher. You had Bob Feller in the fifties with all those strikeouts. Um, I got to go uh, I got to go with the guy you know Don Drysdale too. Actually, I just thought of him. I'm going to go with the guy that was the brushback guy that was like dangerous out there, like like you know the batter was nervous, especially you know back at the, the kind of helmets they had back then. They would even you know I mean th- this guy would pop you in the head and not even think twice about it or brush you off. And he was a, he was a mean dude. I mean a great guy off the field, but on the pitch and mound was like another story and uh i always liked him he had that that awesome like wind up that big swoop back and then this kick and uh i loved him and he was uh, he's my right hand pitcher and it's the one and only from st louis cardinals uh, bob gibson bob gibson he's the guy i wanted my mound especially in 1968 when he had a 1.12 era i believe he lost nine games that year which uh was pretty pretty wild to have a one era that means you that means you're giving up one run a game i'd like, love to see how many times they were shut out when he pitched because it must have been out of nine losses i bet they were shut out at least five or six times you know or or or, or they lost you know two one you know i mean it's just uh it's amazing to me he lost those nine games that year but you know bob gibson's the righty and um i guess i, I gotta go with mariano mariano rivera as the closer uh yeah, I mean the only unanimous guy to to hit into the uh, Hall of Fame, which is pretty pretty impressive, since you had all those other players that were never unanimous, including uh, including Ruth, including Ty Cobb. I mean Cobb wasn't likable, uh, or he probably wasn't liked by a lot of writers, even though I liked him. Uh, you had Mage, Dema- uh, Gar- even Garrick after after. The tragedy of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, um, Lou Gehrig does not get a unanimous vote into the Hall of Fame after that career. I mean, that's 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 actually almost mind blowing. That one, Ruth, you could see because you figure some writers probably didn't like him, but you know, Gehrig was likable. He died tragically, probably the, at that time the greatest. He was number two in the all time home run list. Not unanimous, but Mariano gets unanimous, and uh, he's uh, he was something. When he came in, it was lights out. I mean, the guy uh, he closed the deal, and he was uh, he was my all time closer. So that's my all time baseball team. Uh, that's my version. So far. this is quick. I like I like this. That's why I'm coming on weekly. Do my little Ray K, uh, my little Ray K catching up with Ray K. Hit and miss. Here we go. I'm going to do four four quick ones. I did a few versions of this. Okay, first thing that comes to mind. Okay. I'm going to do a transportation version. All right, car. Hmm, car. Car. You need car. You need a car. You need a car, especially in the suburbs of Jersey. Um, um, 
I don't know, BMW. I mean, that seems to come to mind for car. It's not, it's, it's not my choice of car, but I guess it rolls off the tongue pretty easy. When I hear a car, I, I think of BMW, you know, and I, I think of those taking trips across country down to Florida. I mean, you know, these great roadways. I mean, car, car, car is a, is a very positive thing. Uh, next word, plane. Plane is, is great, too, because you could travel far distance in it, and you could see places that are in Europe in only five or six hours, you know, which is pretty pretty crazy. It's like taking a bus ride to, um, you know, to Maryland, you know, or maybe maybe Virginia. You know, it's like a six-hour bus ride, but you, you wake up, you know, you take a nap on the, pl- or the plane overnight, and you wake up and you're in London, you know, or you're in Rome. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing concept, and the safety of them is really amazing. I mean, it's, a, it's the safest type of transportation, so if anyone's afraid to travel, don't be afraid because, uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, the odds of you are more, as they say, if you walk out to get your your, your mail than to go in a, in a plane crash, you know, so, but planes are, are awesome. I mean, it's, uh, it's a great thing. Train. Trains are cool. Trains are good if you have to go like just an hour or hour and a half, maybe three hours. You know, that way you don't got to you don't got to deal with driving, you know, for like a shorter type distance. You know, you go to Washington, D.C., take the train. You know, it's like three hours uh, by train. You, you sleep. You could read your Kindle. You could read your books. You could eat a little bit. You know, you could you could you could take the nap uh, instead of driving six hours in traffic. You know, because there's always traffic going to D.C. or I've got to go to New York. You had a train, you get there, boom, in an hour, and it's done. You know, no traffic. You know, there's always a lot of traffic, it seems, you know, when you travel to these cities. So train is good. And my final my final word on the hit miss is bus. And you know what? That's the one thing I, I dislike the most is the bus. You know, it, it it even doesn't even sound good. You know, it's just big and clumsy and these, those fumes when you're walking on. I mean, school buses are cool. I mean, I love school buses. They're safe. I mean, you get a great feeling when you see those yellow school buses driving around for the kids. I mean, they're, they're fine. But the transportation buses, you know, you go to Atlantic City and then maybe, you know, you get like a deal. I guess I guess maybe I can do that. But taking like a bus to the city or back i don't know you're still in traffic you know you're sitting with about 75 strangers you don't know who the driver is you hear these things these things you know crashing on the parkway even though i know it's rare it's rare yeah i I just i prefer not to take a bus unless it's in a city and then you kind of take the buses around you know it's like the next stop which is fine but suburb suburbs or you know open open driving bus is uh I, i give it the thumbs down that's my 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 worst type of transportation is the bus so there you go that's ray k catch catching up ray k those are my uh, hit and miss association i hope you enjoyed this one you know recapping my london trip my my concierge and my my all-time baseball teams i'll be back next week have a good day